Welcome everyone to this webinar on women resisting climate change in the global south and um, that's co-organized between the Galway Feminist Collective and Friends of the Earth Ireland. My name is Siam. I'm the Education Officer at Friends of the Earth. Um, this webinar is part of a seminar series um, that initially started with in-person events and then moved online because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the seminar the seminars have been focused on exploring the root causes and consequences of global injustice and linking environmental and climate injustices with other forms of injustice. Um, so tonight is specifically looking at climate change and environmental injustice from a feminist perspective. Um, so part of the seminar series is also about collaborating with other small organizations and with grassroots groups. And that's why you know, we're so delighted to be able to collaborate with the Galway Feminist Collective on, uh, on this webinar. And where we can, we've been trying to um, offer the use of our resources, such as webinar software, to, to other organizations and other groups. So moving online has had its challenges, but one advantage is, is that it's made it easier for us to collaborate and work with people outside of Dublin, which has always been a challenge and um, a valid criticism as well. Um, and it's also allowed us to have guest speakers from outside of Ireland, which is really, really, really exciting. So we're, we're really delighted to have um, Lolita Chavez joining us tonight and uh, Zainab, Zainab Gadamfar, who will be joining in a little while. Um, so I'm just going to change the view for a second so that you can see everybody who's here um, on the call. So I just want to introduce some of the people that are in the background. So we have Lolita, who is one of our speakers, and we're going to introduce her properly in a minute. Uh, Jacinta from the Galway Feminist Collective, who's going to be moderating. Anya from the Galway Feminist Collective, Vicenza and Maria, and Ashling, who's going to be doing the interpretation between Spanish and English. So one thing I just want to ask your patience with is the interpretation. Um, as Lolita is going to be speaking in Spanish and Ashling is going to be interpreting. And then in order to make this webinar as participative or as accessible as possible, um, we are also going to do some summary interpretations of what's said in English into Spanish so that Lolita can understand. And also because we know that some people have connected from other parts of the world to hear Lolita speak. Um, so I just ask for your patience with that. And when I finish this short introduction, I'm also going to say a little summary of it in Spanish for everybody, for everybody to hear. Oh, very well. um, so and lastly, I just I'm going to hand over to Jacinta. You're muted there, Jacinta. Great. Um, thanks, Jan, and thanks everyone for joining um, this evening. Um, and we were really happy to work with Friends of the Earth on this event to explore the links between climate change, patriarchy um, and colonialism. Uh, and to just give you a little introduction to the Galway Feminist Collective. We're an intersectional feminist group and we're based here in Galway. Um, and when we say intersectional, uh, we mean that women's experiences are not the same um, and that there are many different systems of oppression and domination. So systems that have power over marginalized groups and that they intersect and support one another, like sexism and racism or sexism and classism. Um, and an intersectional approach means that we want to challenge all these systems. Um, and white Western feminism can erase these different experiences. So we aim to make spaces for women's voices who are often um, underrepresented and marginalized by mainstream feminist discussions including women of colour, migrant women, uh, traveller and Roma women, working class women, the LGBTQ community, particularly trans women, women with disabilities and sex workers. Um, and then we also want to connect with our sisters who are fighting these struggles um, elsewhere, which is why um, events like this are really important. And as feminists, we also think it's important to engage in environmental activism um, because we recognize that the same system of domination that harms us also harms the planet. So we think, that, we think it's important to connect struggles against sexism, racism, and climate change, because we see that the root of a lot of these different crises can be found in the systems of capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. Um, 
And while thinking about these struggles, um, this isn't new to feminism, um, ecofeminism includes uh, non-human nature in the discussion. So it's about emancipation or freedom from domination for all oppressed groups, including nature. Um, and we feel we need to shift from seeing the earth as an object to extract natural resources from to a living landscape full of memories, stories, ancestors, and non-human life. I'm just thinking about why, um, why these topics are relevant to our activism here in Ireland. Um, extracted resources from the global south are imported into and used in the global north, and this includes Ireland. Indigenous communities are forced off their land and their livelihoods are taken away from them while capitalism thrives on the stolen resources. So we have a duty to be aware of this colonial endeavour and to resist the destruction of communities and the ecosystems they are part of. Um, and Ireland may be a post-colonial country, but we still benefit from the power relations between the global north and the global south, which originated in colonialism. And the proposed liquefied nat natural gas terminals in Kerry and Cork are good examples. We have banned uh, fracking, so it's not acceptable here, but it's fine if it happens somewhere, uh, somewhere far away and we import that gas. Um, but this threatens indigenous communities, ways of life, their livelihoods and their safety. Uh, or another example of Money Point burning coal from the Carahan mine in Colombia, um, you know, which is rife with uh, human rights abuses abuses against local indigenous communities. Um, also, we can see how climate change is now being presented as this new threat that's kind of coming for us, um, but that this isn't, but that this is something that people in the global north have been resisting for years. So they are the experts. Um, these are the front lines of the struggle against climate change, and these are the voices we need to be listening to and learning from. Um, and these struggles may not be framed in the language of environmental activism, um, but these are the struggles that are the front lines of defense of the earth. Um, they may be more about territory, air, land, and spir spiritual connection to the earth. And it's important we don't impose our own Western framing on struggles and to listen to people who are involved in those struggles um, who may call themselves water protectors, earth defenders, First Nation activists, or indigenous rights defenders. Um, and we need to challenge solutions which come from a colonial framework, um, like conservation work which has kicked indigenous people off their land. Um, if we focus on solutions without, uh, without a decolonial perspective, um, then we'll continue to use uh, extractivism, extracting resources from the global south, um, only this time it will be for, the, for minerals needed for green energy rather than um, rather than for fossil fuels. Um, so people will continue to be pushed off their fertile lands into more marginal lands um, or what's being called the final frontiers or the new enclosures um, due to this extractivism for mining. And also looking at what sol solidarity means for us as feminists and how we act that solidarity. Um, so feminism unfortunately can also be co-opted for neo-colonial and capitalist ends. Um, so we recognize that white Western feminism often ignores the ways that capitalism and patriarchy primarily oppress uh, black and ethnic minority women globally. Uh, and this is being compounded by the environmental crisis. Um, so the Go White Feminist Collective strive to act our solidarity by platforming voices that aren't usually included, focusing on those who are most affected. Um, and grassroots environmental organizations around the world are dominated by women, mainly women of color, while institutional organizations are dominated by Western professional men. So it's estimated that 60 to 80% of the membership of environmental organizations worldwide are made up of women. Um, and environmental defenders are killed at a rate of almost four per week across the, across the world, and that's mostly women indigenous leaders. Of the 304 human rights defenders killed in 2019, more than half were environmental and indigenous rights defenders. The Americas is the most dangerous region in the world for environmental human rights defenders, with Colombia, Brazil, Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico, um, and in Asia, the Philippines being the most dangerous countries in the world to be a human rights um, defender. So Bertha Carreras, who was murdered as a result of her activis activism, has become an emblem for the struggle with the saying, Bertha didn't die, she multiplied. 
So despite all these dangers, women still stand up for land rights, indigenous rights, reproductive rights, against gendered violence, and for a livable environment. And both of our speakers are here to share their experiences of being part of that global resistance. And we're really grateful um, that they've taken the time to be with us this evening. So now we'll hand it over to, to our first speaker, um, Aura Lolita Chavez Ishpakik, um, who is a Maya Kiche Indigenous Educator and Human Rights Defender from Guatemala. She's the leader of the Council of Chique Peoples in Defense of Land of Life, Mother Earth, Mother Nature, Earth and Territory, um, and a member of the Network of Ancestral Healers of Community Feminism, uh, which is an Indigenous-led organization that supports women activists and human rights defenders involved in community struggles. And she was forced to leave Guatemala in 2017 due to threats against her life and has yet been unable to return. Um, and in 2017, she was one of the finalists chosen by the European Parliament for the Shakora of Human Rights Award. And in 2018, she received the Ignacio Award from the Basque government for her work in defending the land of the Quiche people against exploitation. Um, so, um, Ashton can translate that and then we'll hand over to Lolita. Bueno, Hel, quien ya con Richiliguch, con la energía vital de las ancestras eh, y con nuestra luz colectiva encendida, este, quiero expresar también con la fuerza sagrada de la ruda, que es parte de nuestra medicina ancestral y que hoy nos acompaña. Expre expresarme aquí en primera persona es para mí un acto dignificante no solo para mí sino también para mi pueblo porque es una expresión para romper el silencio y es una expresión para seguir exigiendo justicia por todas las expresiones eh, contra nuestras vidas y por lo que sigue pasando en el territorio con las empresas extractivistas saqueadoras que siguen allá en los territorios. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having me. Um, Lolita gave a short introduction in her Quiche language, um, and she. So I'm just going to skip over that because I don't speak Quiche, but um, basically, yeah. So with um, the vital energy um, and our collective light and the Ruda plant, which is one of our medicinal plants, I'd like to thank you for having me today. Um, coming here in person to express myself is a dignifying act for me and my people, not only because it involves breaking the silence, but also because we continue to demand justice for all actions taken against our lives and for what continues to happen in our territories because of the presence of extractive companies. Agradezco profundamente a quienes con esfuerzos múltiples están haciendo que nuestras voces eh, no queden silenciadas y agradezco también porque, porque nuestras voces, ustedes saben que están siendo perseguidas, pero no solo nuestras voces, sino nuestras vidas perseguidas, criminalizadas, estigmatizadas y atacadas y estas expresiones pues hacen que, que también nuestra lucha no quede en, en el olvido ni en el silencio. Ahora más que nunca la humanidad necesita escucharnos, la humanidad necesita acuerparnos gracias a los colectivos feministas, gracias a la Red Internacional de Amigos de la Tierra, a quienes desde otros continentes también se están uniendo a Viayala. Les agradecemos profundamente porque nuestra lucha continúa Estamos en pie de lucha, estamos resistiendo y esta resistencia es porque también necesitamos que nos acuerpen a no dejarnos morir y no dejar morir a las grandes expresiones milenarias de resistencia y de vida vinculada con la Madre Tierra. I'd like to deeply thank the multiple groups who have worked to ensure the voices of those who are persecuted, criminalized, and st stigmatized and attacked are not silenced. Now more than ever, humanity needs to listen to us and support us. 
Thank you to the Galway Feminist Collective and the International Network of Friends of the Earth and to, to those joining Abayella, the Abayella resistance from other continents who are working to ensure that the great millennium expressions of resistance are supported and the life connected with Mother Earth does not die. Vivir systematicamente y permanentemente la persecución es parte del, de, del modelo depredador es parte de ese plan de exterminio del neoliberalismo unido al patriarcado y unido al racismo. Es plan. Es plan que nos silencia, nos tortura y nos invisibiliza bajo sistemas de opresión permanente desde los gobiernos de los estados como el estado de Guatemala genocida. Mi caso es un caso como miles de miles de defensoras Y es un caso que no está aislado y no puede quedar aislado ni silenciado, sino ha, ha sido ese plan permanente, ese plan que se hace en los grandes hoteles, en las grandes dimensiones y en donde se juntan los multimillonarios y de donde se juntan los representantes de las potencias mundiales para eliminarnos para eliminar no solo la vida de la humanidad, sino la vida también de la biodiversidad y de la madre tierra. Esos intereses se quedan simplemente en lo que le llaman ganancias del dinero, en lo que le llaman también esos capitales en, a los que ellos honran. Nosotras honramos a nuestras ancestras, honramos la vida, pero ellos honran al capital, el capital que nos genera Muerte y destrucción. The systematic and permanent pe persecution that we live is part of the predatory and exterminating model of patriarchal and racist neoliberalism. It silences, tortures, and makes us invisible under systems of oppression from governments such as Guatemala. My case, like those of thousands of, of human rights defenders, is not an isolated one but it has been planned in the fancy hotels where multi-millionaires and transnational companies who are only interested in money and profits gather to plan our elimination, to destroy the biodiversity and destroy the earth. They honor capital while we honor life. ¿Y quiénes son las vidas más afectadas? ¿Y quiénes son las vidas más excluidas? Es lo que le, le preguntamos a la humanidad. ¿Quiénes son esas vidas? Son las nuestras, somos las mujeres, somos las comunidades y los pueblos originarios que tenemos historia y tenemos memoria. Por eso, el abordaje que le daré es poniendo en el centro que somos las mujeres las más afectadas. Y no tenemos miedo de decirlo, porque es la realidad que vivimos. Por este modelo extractivista en América Latina. Y aquí lo abordaré teniendo conciencia que soy feminista comunitaria, aunque no les guste que, los, que las defensoras y las mujeres que venimos de los pueblos originarios nos llamemos y nos autonombremos feministas. No les gusta, no les conviene porque rompemos con esas ataduras misógenas. Pero hoy, nombrándome feminista, al estar directamente en los territorios y conviviendo en comunidad desde un territorio con las expresiones de poder permanente, patriarcal, capitalista y racista. La acción autónoma es rápida. La acción es urgente, urgente de o somos defensores o morimos en el camino. Venimos entonces a defender el territorio a defender la tierra por la vida. Y por la vida, porque eso que pasa lo, lo vivimos en la piel, en nuestra propia piel, vivimos las múltiples opresiones cada día, cada momento, cada parte de nuestro caminar estamos viviendo esas expresiones que han dado como resultado, y no es sencillo el resultado que hemos vivido en los territorios, han dado como resultado genocidio, torturas, desmembraciones. O sea, no tenemos que estudiar las expresiones del patriarcado, porque el patriarcado y el capitalismo y el racismo lo tenemos en la memoria celular.
Who are the people most affected by all these dynamics? It is women and indigenous people. The approach I will take this evening puts women at the center as the people most affected by the extractive model in Latin America and is informed by my community feminism, even though they don't like it that we call ourselves feminists because we are breaking patri patriarchal chains. Through a direct presence in the territories, living together in community in a territory where the persistence of patriarchal, capitalist and racist power is ever present, our autonomous action is extremely urgent. We either become defenders or we die and we see our people and Mother Earth die as a result of the multiple oppressions which we have experienced with our own flesh. Every day, every moment, these oppressions have caused genocide, torture and disintegration. We do not have to study the expressions of patriarchy, capitalism and racism because we have lived them. It's, it, it's written into our cell memory. Eso hace entonces que nos autoconvoquemos, que nos juntemos. Muchas veces he de decirle que iniciamos nuestro accionar en la clandestinidad y no nos da vergüenza de aceptarlo y de decirlo porque estamos en territorios militarizados en donde vale más la bala que la vida. Y, y ya con esa fuerza organizativa salimos a lo público. Pues si salimos sin previa organización, nos matan, o nos desaparecen, o nos violan, o nos torturan en los cuarteles, en los hospitales, en los caminos, en la calle. Entonces la autoorganización es clave. Es clave porque también si, si no nombramos la violencia, la violencia continúa. Pero es necesario la autoorganización. Sin estrategia en asambleas o públicamente, inmediatamente el opresor que tenemos más cerca es quien nos elimina o manda a eliminar con violencia en los diferentes ámbitos. Los actores pueden ser desde los maridos que están muy cerca, los hermanos, los papás, los pastores, los alcaldes, los párrocos, los sicarios, hasta militares y caibiles o de otros rangos. Después siguen los presidentes, los finqueros, los banqueros o los empresarios. Creo que si yo hubiera silenciado, estuviera hoy muerta, ahora muerta. Porque al sufrir de tortura, una palpa el dilema de o denuncio o no denuncio. Hay un terror muy profundo. Es parte de cómo hemos interiorizado al opresor. Por eso es muy clave el acuerparnos, acuerparnos con amor a esto que nosotras vivimos en los territorios. These experiences call us, bring us together, often beginning clandestinely. I'm not ashamed to say so, because in our territories, which are militarized, bullets are valued more than lives. We only become public when we are already strong, because if we go out as individuals, they kill us or make us disappear. They rape us in our houses or they torture us in the military barracks, the hospitals, on the roads, in the street. Self-organization is key, because if we name the violence publicly, alone without our strategy or the support of our assembly the oppressor who's closest to us is the one who will try to silence us or send someone to eliminate us those oppressors can be our husbands brothers parents the pastor the mayor parish priests hitmen military officers presidents landowners bankers or businessmen i really believe that if i had remained silent i too would be dead now because Suffering from torture, there is a terrible dilemma whether to report or not. The fear is extremely deep. This is how, how, part of how we internalize the, pre the oppressor. And for this re reason, it is essential that we are supported and that we're supported with love. Al estar organizadas, una descubre entonces un gran abanico que nos da la posibilidad, la posibilidad tan solo de vivir, la posibilidad de estar sanas de formación, de acuerparnos, de poder denunciar colectivamente, de generar red, acompañar procesos judiciales, acompañar otras luchas. En la región, en el continente de Abiyayala, 
las expresiones casi siempre se repiten. Por eso nosotras le llamamos patrones recurrentes, con fuerte entramado entre el racismo, misoginia y el capitalismo. Por ejemplo, inician con rumores tomando como base nuestros roles hacia mujeres indígenas, la sexualidad, la espiritualidad y, y ese poder patriarcal de la difamación también. Ya empieza a aparecer, en bol, aparecemos en boletines, los medios ya se hacen cargo de, 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 del crimen de comunicación. O sea, los medios tienen mucho que ver en cómo nos criminalizan. Eh, nos ponen en, en el foco del ataque, eh, nuestros nombres están en el foco del ataque, en quiche los militares, principalmente los sanguinarios que son los caiviles, llaman que ya no, nosotras aparecemos en lista negra, así le llaman los militares, y ahí es que sí, sí o sí nos toca eh, ser asesinadas cuando ya aparecemos en esos listados, yo aparecí en ese listado. Eh, ya nos toca desplazarnos o desaparecernos, eh, pero antes eh, se sabe que la, la ley es que se nos violen sexualmente, nos torturen eh, o nos en, encarcelen. Por, por todo ello, eh, es que se nos juzga primero ju eh, socialmente a través de la comunicación eh, como criminales. Ahí nos empiezan a ver que la tipificación de nuestra vida es que somos criminales para la, que la gente tenga miedo, para que la gente tenga vergüenza y que la gente se sienta culpable de ser parte de nuestra organización que tipifican como criminal. Through organization, we can discover a huge range of possibilities that allow us to act. The possibility of um, being healthy, of healing, training, receiving support, collective denunciations, creating networks, accompanying judicial processes, and accompanying other struggles. Through, throughout the region and the Awayela, these expressions of violence are almost always repeated, which is why we would call them recurring patterns. They have a strong interplay between racism, misogyny, and capitalism. It starts with rumors directed towards indigenous women that target their sexuality and their spirit, spirituality. There are defamations. You start to appear in newsletters and bulletins. The media participates in these kind of communication crimes. That is, they put our names or their photos and we become targets. In Quiche, the military, particularly the elite squad of Caiviles, put us on blacklists. And that's when we know that we've been targeted for murder, disappearance, or displacement. I was on one of those lists. But before it gets to that point, we can be raped, tortured, or imprisoned. And in all this, we are judged socially as criminals. And for those, for those reasons, people are afraid, shamed, or feel guilty about being part of the organization. In my situation, que, que les puedo hablar, es que en mi territorio mi condición de, de, de ser defensora de la vida, de ser feminista y autoridad maya, es lo que a mí me puso a enfrentar contra redes criminales. Eh, redes criminales que pretenden despojar al pueblo de los bienes comunes más esenciales para la vida, que es por ejemplo el agua, la tierra y los bosques, y también despojarnos de nuestro modelo de vida. Estoy consciente, yo estoy consciente que eh, hayamos desafiado normativas patriarcales, religiosas, sociales y hasta legales acerca de la feminidad y el papel más pasivo que eh, se nos impuso con la ley en mi pueblo. Yo estoy clara, pero, pero no teníamos otro camino. Las agresiones de las cuales fui, fui víctima fueron desde insultos verbales, misógenos, acoso sexual, violencia sexual, expresiones masivas de odio contra mí, hasta llegar a situaciones extremas de seis, de seis intentos de asesinato con agresiones a mano armada, casos que fueron denunciados al sistema de justicia y hasta la fecha he estado en la espera de la justicia. Y por eso es la fuerza que pido que se una con nosotras a exigir justicia. A consecuencia de lo anterior, hemos agotado los mecanismos de, de supuesto derecho constitucional presentando una gran cantidad de denuncias. 
distintas denuncias a distintas instancias del Estado. No nos hemos cansado. Hemos presentado tantas denuncias de crímenes contra nuestra comunidad y contra los bienes naturales como los constantes ataques contra mi persona. Sin embargo, las instancias responsables no investigan, eh, no procesan ni, eh, ni hacen expresiones de dar con los que cometieron los delitos de, contra nosotras y contra nuestro pueblo. Eso es lo que eh, puedo resumir en la situación personal. Lolita, solo le digo que quizás cinco minutos que está corriendo el tiempo, entonces traduzco y si puede hacer la próxima parte como un poco más resumida. Muy bien. And re regarding my story, in my territory as a defender of life, a feminist, a Maya Quiche ancestral authority, I've come to face criminal networks that seek to strip the Quiche people of their natural resources that are essential for our life such as the water, land, forest, and the way, our way of life and spirituality according to the Quiche worldview. These networks have continuously committed criminal acts to the detriment of the fundamental rights of Quiche communities, crimes which have been left in total and absolute impunity. I'm aware of the fact that I've challenged patriarchal, religious, social, and even legal regulations regarding femininity and the more passive role that society has wanted to impose on me and that this challenge could cost me my life. But we had no other way. The attacks against me ranged from misogynistic verbal insults, sexual harassment, sexual violence, widespread expressions of hatred, culminating in six assassination attempts by armed aggressors. These cases were reported to the police, but to date they have been left in total impunity and the aggressors remain free and continue to act in the same way. We have exhausted all mechanisms within national and constitutional law by filling a large number of complaints with state institutions relating to crimes against the communities, the environment, as well as constant attacks against me. However, the institutions responsible have not carried out investigations, prosecutions, nor punish those responsible for the crimes reported. Furthermore, they also fail to inform us about the progress of the investigations. That is what happens as to Quiche, a town which is still subjected to structures that contributed to acts of genocide during the war. Actualmente, la protección eh, jurídica juega un papel muy importante junto con mi reubicación. Un papel relevante, pues, en, eh, este, enfrento procesos complejos de criminalización que incluyen demandas interpuestas contra mí me han acusado de varios supuestos delitos que no cometí, como lo, la coacción y amenaza, reunión, de, reunión y me, manifestación ilícita, asociación ilícita, detenciones ilegales, plagio y secuestro, allanamiento ilegal, atentado contra la Constitución de la República de Guatemala. Eh, y quienes me, me acusan son las empresas, trabajadores públicos, sicariato, funcionarios públicos, agentes de seguridad privada, agentes de seguridad nacional de las empresas. Por eso es que seguimos exigiendo justicia porque la defensa de las montañas, que es nuestra inspiración, y la defensa del agua es nuestra vida. Denuncio al Estado de Guatemala por la ausencia de consultas previas, libres e informadas al llegar las empresas transnacionales que tenemos el, la ratificación del convenio 169 de la OIT en la implementación de proyectos extractivos nunca se nos consultó cuando llegaron las mineras, las hidroeléctricas, las petroleras, el monocultivo forestal y el monocultivo agrícola nunca se nos consultó pues demuestra claramente que el Estado de Guatemala es un Estado racista, no respeta nuestros derechos como pueblos originarios, no respeta las normas internacionales y ha hecho que empresas transnacionales actúen con total impunidad. El número de asesinatos y ataques contra defensoras aumenta cada día y el número de, criminaliz de, de hermanas y hermanos criminalizados en los territorios continúa, las, los asesinatos continúan, las violaciones eh, continúan y este, no podemos dejar por un lado también lo que pasó 
en el año 2017, cuando nuestras hermanas eh, jóvenes eh, denunciaron también la, las violaciones sexuales que por eso fueron eh, calcinadas el 8 de, de marzo del 2017. Esas son las justicias que exigimos, esa es la dignidad, por lo que nuestras vidas eh, siguen, siguen diciéndole al mundo que queremos tan solo vivir. Muchas gracias. Um, so, I denounce the state of Guatemala for the absence of free, prior and informed consultations as written as stipulated in the ILO Convention 169, which was ratified by Guatemala, and in the implementation of extractive projects such as forestry, hydroelectric, mining, monocultures, without consultation from communities. This clearly demonstrates the racist state of, that the racist state of Guatemala does not respect our rights as indigenous peoples. This respect, this respect for international norms has allowed transnational companies to act with total impunity in Guatemala, causing damages across the territories and generating conflicts that create an atmosphere conducive to attacks against human rights defenders. The number of murders and attacks against human rights defenders and organizations that defend collective, individual, economic, social, cultural, and Mother Earth rights has increased in recent years. Violence against women continues as a serious problem in Guatemala and violent deaths have increased. We cannot forget the state femicide of 41 girls who dared to denounce the sexual violence that they were experiencing at a state care home that occurred on International Women's Day 2017. And legal protection in my case currently plays a vital role along with my relocation as I have faced complex criminal process that includes lawsuits filed against me. I have been accused of several crimes that I did not commit, which include coercion, threats, association and illegal demonstrations, illicit association, illegal arrests, kidnapping and legal trespassing and attacks against the constitution and the Republic and attacks against national security. The people accusing me include companies, workers, public servants, community workers, hired assassins, private security agents, and national security agents. This is why we're asking for help and support. And this is why we're demanding justice and dignity for the Quiche communities. Over to you. Um, Lolita, do you want to introduce the crowdfunding, Jacinta, or will I pass it to Lolita? Well, if Lolita wants to, yeah. to say a little bit about the, the work that they're yeah. doing with the COVID response, that would be great. Lolita, ¿quiere compartir un poco sobre el, eh, las banderas blancas? Muy brevemente. Bueno, las banderas blancas, eh, Guatemala, estamos viviendo la situación de las secuelas por la crisis del de COVID-19, de la COVID-19, sí, del COVID-19, Lamentablemente, la situación de, de estar en un estado muy excluyente ha hecho que lo, lo que más se viva en los territorios es la hambruna, la falta de agua, la criminalización, la presencia de las, empre de las empresas, pero también de, de los militares. Entonces, el gran problema que está afectando a Guatemala es la hambruna, la desnutrición, porque ustedes saben que hay empobrecimiento y vivir una pandemia sin trabajo, sin agua, sin, este, eh, sin alimento, es también una destrucción masiva. Entonces, las banderas eh, blancas se hacen como una expresión en las casas. O sea, hay una campaña para que se coloquen las banderas eh, eh, blancas en las casas más empobrecidas, donde hay mucha hambruna, donde no hay alimento para que se pueda auxiliar. Entonces, varias organizaciones estamos a, auxiliando esta situación para no pasar hambruna, para no dejar a la gente morir de hambre. Y eso es lo, la, la campaña que está. Hay banderas también rojas para lo, la, auxiliar a los ancianos y ancianas y hay banderas ro, eh, eh, negras para auxiliar también la violencia contra las mujeres. Entonces, estas son las banderas blancas como la última esperanza de vida para no padecer, para no sufrir, eh, por no tener medicina y por no tener alimento 
en las casas, que es lo que más se está haciendo de las expresiones más crueles de la política que está utilizando el Estado genocida de Guatemala. Um, Lolita's organization, CPK, and others are helping with a campaign that's happening in Guatemala in, called the White Flags in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, as she mentioned, uh, Guatemala is an extremely, um, is a state where there's extreme social exclusion and the biggest impact of the pandemic so far is that people are going hungry and are uh, without water. They're without jobs to um, be able to support themselves in this moment and there is no state support. So um, one of the expressions of solidarity that has begun to happen is that people are leaving white flags outside their um, houses when families are running out of food or have run out of food and voluntary and social organizations such as the CPK are attending those calls for help by providing food to the families. They're also um, they leave out uh, red flags if old, older people need help and they leave out black flags if there's a situation of domestic violence. These are the, this is the last hope of many people in Guatemala who've been in completely abandoned by the state to be able to confront the current crisis and to not die of hunger. And so we'll share the crowdfunder in the chat. So the Galway Feminist Collective and the Latin American Solidarity Center, LASC, have set up a, a GoFundMe so you can donate um, online. So that'll be shared in the chat and we'll also be sharing it on social media. Um, so we'd appreciate it if people would also um, share it and circulate it as well. Um, and thank you so much, Lolita, um, for sharing the, um, sharing the experience of the Kiche people and your resistance. Um, and also the power of yourself organizing and the violence that um, you meet as a response to that. Um, and I think you've really shown, you know, that the struggles against misogyny and racism and capitalism are, are so interlinked. So, so thanks so much. Um, and we will, um, or Ashley, if you want to translate that, or I can, or maybe I can introduce Zainab and you can do the whole, and you can do the whole thing. Um, so our next speaker is Zainam Gadamfar, and she's an environmental legal officer for the Save Lamu Community Organization, um, and that's based in Lamu County in Kenya. Um, so she's been involved in visiting remote areas around Lamu um, to talk about the impacts of the coal plant, of a proposed coal plant for the area. Um, so she has a background in law, and she brings that uh, passion to work with local communities and to campaign to save her local area of Lamu from the destruction of a coal plant. Um, and the proposed plant is a threat to the community's health and their livelihoods, and it could potentially displace 120,000 people. Um, and human rights defenders involved with the campaign have faced police harassment and arrest. Um, and the campaign has had a recent legal victory, which Zainab will tell us more about. Um, and Save Lamu, they're also part of the Decolonize campaign, and that's a movement committed to stopping the development of coal and coal related industries um, in Kenya. Uh, and they're campaigning for a clean, sustainable energy future for Kenya and the region. And Save Lamu is also a member of Women, an African Gender and Extractive Alliance, which works to advance an African post extractivist, eco just women-centered alternative to the dominant destructive model of development. So I'll hand it over to Ashling just to translate that and then we'll go over to Zainab. Hi everyone, thank you very much uh, to Galway Feminist Collective and Friends of the Earth for inviting us to speak on this event. Uh, we are very very much honored. An environmental community legal officer in Sevlamu uh, Sevlamo is uh, a community-based organization uh, that is formed uh, by 35 civil service organizations. So it's like a consortium uh, made of very many organizations at the local level. Um, uh, 
It was formed in 2010 and basically uh, the reason why it was formed was to ensure that uh, uh, the community has a voice in development projects that come to, to Lamu and that will affect Lamu and the structure of Lamu and the livelihoods of the people of Lamu. Uh, so um, I would like to start by saying that Lamu is a very beautiful, serene and peaceful island of the coast of Kenya. and. Uh, since time immemorial, this place was uh, characterized by Swahili settlement and uh, uh, since the 13th century. So it's very rich in history. It has uh, a title of uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site and uh, people come all over the world to enjoy vacations because we have beautiful beaches and so many uh, uh, scenic and beautiful uh, um, marine and oceanic views and uh, tourism and fishing is a major uh, economic backbone of this place. 80% uh, of the population uh, rely on uh, fishing, that is traditional fishing, uh, using small dows or boats uh, around the archipelagic waters uh, in the economic, special economic zone to fish. And that's how they, they earn their livelihood. They fish and in, during the night, they sell their fish during the day. And basically that's how their life is all about because they don't know any other life. They don't know about studying. They don't know about uh, 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 degrees or education. The only chance they have is to survive at this basic level. And uh, uh, another economic backbone is tourism. So fishing and tourism are the two most important things. Uh, one, if, if in any case, one of these uh, industries is destroyed, there'll be no Lamo. Okay, there'll be no Lamu, the, the beauty of Lamu, the money that uh, circles around these people basically comes from those two things. So that is just for you to understand exactly where, what we are talking about here, in which place uh, this uh, coal plant wants to be built. So moving on quickly, um, Safe Lamu was formed simply because a large mega project worth billions of dollars was coming here. Uh, uh, it's a part of the 2030 vision of Kenya, uh, our country, to have as many uh, energy and industrialization as possible. So uh, a part of the program was to have this huge uh, transport corridor project that is called the Lamu Hot South Sudan Ethiopia Transport Corridor Project in Lamu of all the places. Lamu was the one that was chosen. Before this, Lamu is was basically a marginalized county with historical injustices dating back before uh, before independence and all the way to independ uh, post-independence, land grabbing, resource, uh, taking advantage of natural resources for other people's gains. So all this uh, background uh, left the county to have poor roads, uh, non, almost non-existent uh, health facilities, uh, very little to no educational uh, opportunities, no uh, multiple sources of income. If you were born here and you're part of the Bajun indigenous communities, all you had to do was fish, learn how to fish and provide food. So, um, you can imagine i've given you the picture of what this place really is uh people simply living basic lifestyles of hand to mouth uh, surviving by their simple skills if it's fishing if it's uh, uh, uh guiding tourists like tour guides and that's how we've survived for all these years so coming uh, to realize the people now started realizing that a major project was coming and this project it will shock everyone to uh, to hear this but no person was ever told about it. It's like uh, the, the proponents of the project, the Lapset project, uh, thought that they were coming to a place 
it's as if there were no people living there. They would just come, start building, start construction, and move on with their project without interference, without any questions asked. So when uh, uh, the civil service organizations present at the time heard about this, they decided to you know come together because uh, we believe that in unity we rise, we become stronger than when you just come uh, as one or a, a civil service organization or as uh, two civil service organizations. So 35 organizations at this grassroots uh, level came together and formed what we call Save Lamo. And Save Lamo was a name inspired to save Lamo, uh, literally save Lamo from any development that was irresponsible to the environment, irrespon uh, destructive to the uh, uh, community's traditional living and lifestyle, uh, to any development and any uh, uh, construction or any decision that is taken without the community's involvement, without their voice, without their uh, consultation. So uh, Save Lamo was formed as a consortium and uh, with very strong objectives, uh, a few being to uh, have and push forward an agenda for responsible and sustainable development. Save Lamo believed that if you don't have uh, uh, the right to say uh, uh, or the right of us uh, of say for um, any development that concerns you that is coming to your area then that development is not worth being there no matter how many advantages it's gonna be you cannot uh, uh, take uh, you cannot just push aside going to drastically and irreparably, you know, change uh, and uh, influence their entire existence, to be honest. So um, for this reason, uh, Sevlam was formed um, and since then, uh, uh, people started uh, uh, lodging and trying to push uh, using judicial mechanisms, uh, lodging a case uh, in 2012 uh, I, for, in, on behalf of fishermen who would be affected by one of, uh, by the construction of one of the components of Lapset, which had already begun. Imagine the designing, the, uh, the conception and the implementation of the project did not involve the people, okay, <laughs> who are going to be living with that project for the rest of their life. So fighting to have uh, the fishermen's rights uh, be had because the, the mega project was going to affect uh, fishing uh, and it, it took over and destroyed mangroves around the area which are harboring fish and other uh, uh, types of crustaceans and also it took along the, the most popular fishing spot for the traditional fishermen who had small boats and fishing poles. So for this reason, uh, while people were busy fighting at the court, uh, trying to push for the agenda of the fishermen, a uh, uh, call came along. The idea that uh, a coal plant was going to be constructed, some say as part of the mega project uh, to fuel the, the entire thing, uh, some say it's, it wasn't really a component, but you know, we know best because people would never agree to say that, uh, to admit that this, that this is wrong and it's really catastrophic to have such energy fuels uh, or such energy fuel options when there are better alternatives. So uh, when coal came along, people had no idea what coal was about. All the, uh, the proponents of uh, the coal plant, that's Amu Power, on, and the government held meetings in different places trying to convince people that a coal project was really going to help them uh, development-wise. It was going to bring uh, more electricity to the town. It was going to give jobs to our youths who are who who are going to be you know who have studied but are jobless at the moment so so many uh, seminars everywhere cropped up people were being convinced of the importance but then now this uh Sev Lamo started research because since call was new it wasn't new just to everyone it was new also to Sev Lamo. so people started researching with whatever resources they had asking questions uh, conducting researches and we found out that call was actually very distracting and no, no matter how much profit it was, it was going to bring to the town, the, the devastating effects of coal on, on the health, on the environment, 
on everything else really um it was just not worth all that you know not worth the project not worth anything it was going to bring so that for that reason people now started the campaign in 2014 to fight against the coal plant which was now threatening their lives and lifestyles and everything else and in 2015 activities began for coal because people now self-educated themselves and we could be able now to start uh, our activities to campaign and do sensitizations but uh, over to you Isley. Um. El caso, está, el caso legal está relacionado con los derechos de los pescadores porque iban a destruir los manglares y otros sitios donde ellos pescan. No hubo consultación porque, con la comunidad porque sabi, el gobierno sabía que la gente se iba a, pro, a oponerse a un proyecto así. Y el gobierno intentó convencer a la gente que un proyecto, ese proyecto les, les iba a, a beneficiar. Pero cuando empezamos a investigar y preguntar, descubrimos que el carbón, carbón es muy destructivo y los impactos económicos no compensan toda la destrucción que iba a provocar. Dana. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Iceling. So moving on, when uh, activities started, uh, they took the following forms. The campaign was launched and the activities were ready and they took the following forms. Through, first of all, we had sensitization or education sessions where we went to, we, we were able to reach for about 40 villages in Lamu to educate them and teach them about coal and the project. They had no idea what was going on because all they had was uh, uh, new development projects were coming and they were going to be very good for this town and the, it would, and the economy of this town. So we had to start from scratch. Some had no idea even about the projects coming. That's how much uh, cut off from the rest of the world we are. So we started small and we were able to educate 40 villages uh, uh, approximately, okay, more or less. So move, uh, another form the campaign took was through radio broadcast broadcasting we had to reach uh, through the local stations we had to talk and educate also because the radio was very much listened to uh, and it, it still is so we could reach a wider audience okay uh, another form the campaign took was through petitions uh, Sevlamo petitioned the county assembly okay and the governor at that time to try and influence them to uh, you know uh, not support such kind of developments okay and another way uh, our current campaign right now is on our website. We are also petitioning. We want to collect uh, uh, at least 55,000 sign-ons, okay, so we can influence uh, uh, the investors of coal at the international level, like China Bank and, and so on. So another form the campaign took is through visits. Um, uh, we, we had to go see for ourselves what happened in those areas in the world, uh, what coal energy did, what that energy, uh, uh, how much destruction it caused so we could see for ourselves and, you know, preach what we actually know to the people, what we've actually seen with our eyes and we have, uh, we have felt with our hearts, you know, so uh, we, we got uh, those trips to South Africa back in 2016 where we went there and also were able to see those areas and the uh, devastating effects it had on, on, on the coal plants had on the people living there, especially the poor people so we have we also went again to india okay india is one of also the largest emitters of uh, uh, any carbon emissions so uh, we went there as well and we saw how devastated the community there was especially the the poor uh, people who are relying on the marine resources the huge coal plants and towers next to the seas destroyed completely the fishes so the fishermen could not afford to send their children to school anymore they, they were displaced, they were living with uh, close to nothing really, so, so 
devastating and so eye-opening. Uh, uh, so other uh, forms of uh, our campaign took was through judicial mechanisms. So we lodged a case, an appeal really uh, at the National Environmental Tribunal, that is the Environment Court. We wanted to, to you know, tell them exactly what is wrong with this project uh, and why other alternatives could not be uh, uh, considered like wind and solar which we have plenty of here in Lamu so uh, the case had the case was lodged on the following grounds the uh, grounds of public participation during the process because they uh, the proponents um, power the proponents of the coal plant felt uh, uh, we antagonized them okay so now there was no chance there was manipulation of the dates of public hearing that is uh, a mandatory for public consultation in those uh, uh, environmental impact assessment study reports that are normally done uh, during any project conception and planning, okay, uh, to mitigate any measures, environmental measures. So you could see that even when we attended those meetings to find out, to put our opinions, to influence the panels, we had, uh, we, we were antagonized. They were a bit hostile, like, you know we we were enemies to them so and through i want to say that through this uh, time it was a very crucial time where people were arrested some of our human rights defenders like ishaq walid were arrested and uh, harassed by the police then we had issues with uh, our office being ransacked for search and seizure or uh, uh, false allegations were put against us for they're saying that we were being funded by terrorists so uh, such things like that so those were the challenges we were facing because uh, it's like the government and the Amupa really wanted to push forward this agenda for coal and we were seen as the enemies who are stopping development we were branded the anti-development so uh, we faced uh, challenges around this time when we were lodging that case and we could uh, we could see that uh, we could never have imagined that the tribunal would hold in our favor and decide to cancel the license uh, for the construction of the coal plant. So that was a very uh, nice win for us after struggling for all this time to find out that uh, our efforts and our hopes were not crushed after all, that someone somewhere could see that the effect this uh, coal plant would have on us and demand actually to uh, to have the uh, National Environmental Management Authority which is in charge of issuing license or permission to go ahead with a project so they were told to actually uh, you know, withdraw the license, it was cancelled, no permission unless a fresh uh, environmental impact assessment study is conducted uh, involving the community, involving the people and their concerns about the, the environment and everything else that they left out. So that was the option that was given to the proponents of the coal uh, plant uh, construction, uh, but they chose the other option, which was to build the decision by the tribunal. So we won in a sense, but we have to keep on fighting because they appealed, because they, they still believe and strongly want to have this uh, coal plant in our place, okay, next to the sea. So um, these people, uh, when you go on Google right now and you check a Lamu coal power plant, you will see on Wikipedia that in the status, it says, in development, it doesn't say cancelled or you know non-materialized or anything else. It still says in development, so that tells us that these people are really you know uh, visualizing having this really happening. Okay, uh, regardless of the effect it will have. So uh, another form they. Uh, the another form is a non-judicial uh, grievance mechanism so after exploiting the judicial mechanisms after all our experiences through the court channels and tribunals we also considered non-judicial grievance mechanisms such as uh, sending letters trying to ask trying to follow the money the trail these people this project costs a lot of money so who is giving the money so we wrote letters to 
IFC, we wrote letters to African Development Bank, we wrote letters to Industrial and Commercial Bank of China and World Bank to try and ask and follow up and influence them to withdraw their investment from the, uh, and their, any connection they have with this coal plant in Kenya. Uh, we have worked with Accountability Council on this, with IDI, that is uh, Inclusive Development International. We've worked with women on this, and women sponsored a trip also to Abidjan at, uh, for, to visit the African Development Bank as well. So our recent complaint option that we are working on right now, uh, we have worked on just recently, uh, was the German DEG bank, okay? Uh, this bank had has very strict social and environmental guidelines, okay? It doesn't just invest anywhere, but uh, through IDI and our partners, we were able to find an intermediary link between a centum investment which owns uh, Amu Power's 51% stake at Amu Power, who is the proponent of the coal project and the one who is in charge of constructing and maintaining it, okay? Uh, we saw a link between the center investment and the standing bank, which is supposed to, which had some uh, financial link of investment. So now we are trying to see how uh, we had a meeting with the Kwasasi and Virginia farmers who are the direct uh, people who are affected directly by this uh, project, the proposed coal plant project. Their land was was taken by the government through compulsory acquisition and they, they some of them are yet to be compensated. So when such a link was uh, found, we went to them, we talked with them, trying to see if they can sign this complaint mechanism and through this channel we can, uh, we can complain to the independent complaint mechanism or ICM at the, of the DEG bank and actually uh, ask for compliance with the social and environmental uh, policy is the bank holds very seriously. Uh, that is our recent campaign. So, okay, uh, moving on to women and the perspective in all these things I've mentioned to you, all the forms of campaign, women and the few women leaders that are in the organization uh, were taking active uh, active participation and making sure that the agendas of, of the campaign are pushed forward uh, successfully. So uh, talking on women, uh, women, the organization that uh, deals with uh, 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 that fights against extractives uh, international in, in, from South Africa. Samantha from Women and another uh, member from Women came to Lamo. Okay, they were on the ground and sponsored meetings uh, to educate women. So we held meetings where uh, participants were all women and we were trying to reach out to them. They talked with them, they educated them and we could see from the, their feedback that uh, the women were willing to work, they were willing, they were not welcoming to the idea of a coal plant ever to be built here. They were actually very uh, concerned about the health impacts of a coal plant uh, on the environment as well, on their future generation and their uh, children, on their health, everything was, uh, was a concern to them. And that was really positive for us and for the campaign. So uh, the coal awareness and sensitization meetings were organized and we had very interesting and very exciting, uplifting and encouraging results from such a uh, uh, from such gatherings. Uh, back then I want to just say that uh, the organization had only two staff working who are female, but right now, uh, years later, we have six full-time staff who are women. When you walk into the organization, you'll just see women from the front desk, in, uh, all the staff and the, all the occupations are women. And we are following in the footsteps of our initiators, uh, and uh, like the coordinator had Jesha Kwe and, and Raya Fama of uh, female, we are trying to, to follow their guidance and their steps. They are training us vigorously every day and night to be there for the women to push the campaign and to sensitize women and to do whatever we can to aggressively participate in, in the campaign. Um, moving on, we had, uh, Yes, uh, I want to say that women also, we had a visit to women in South Africa, 
where we saw a stark difference between uh, activism there and activism here, and we were really concerned for ourselves. Uh, back there, people, uh, w women had no uh, qualms about walking onto the streets and actively, aggressively demonstrating with the one mission of uh, stopping coal and, and uh, uh, defending the environment and Mother Earth. And back here, or in our place, when we came back, we, we were inspired to actually push more and start to uh, actively participate in this. However, we have encountered a few challenges in our campaign because um, most of these challenges uh, I would like to explain to you. So the challenges we've been facing are so many, okay, cultural uh, and religious background of women here prevents them from actively and aggressively demonstrating on the streets. They'll be victimized, okay? They'll be victimized and they will be devalued when they do that. We live in a patriarchal system after all, and it's, it's no different here, especially with religious and cultural, uh, uh, you know, monsters to back that up, then it's a disaster. We also have to schedule different meetings when we we try to go to, to, to these people to, to engage the women in the community. We have to uh, schedule different meetings for women and different for men because the culture dictates that they cannot mingle. So that isn't, isn't really cost effective, neither is it really helpful and women are always having responsibilities either take care of children either to do this back at home that prevents them from having enough time to engage in our activities active and aggressive and aggressive forms of campaign are also not really easy for our women here lack of information is also scary you find that people don't really know exactly what is going on what call is what projects are coming whereas in other parts of the world people actually go from come from everywhere to engage in this like what we are doing here on this webinar, our women, we have to go to them. We have to go into the villages. We have to find them, organize, use whatever resources that are there and face several challenges to, to you know, make our mission uh, possible. Call is also heavily politicized. We had a women representative as well. If someone supports this call and the regime that is there uh, is, is strongly against it or the other way around, people are not elected. So we, uh, and women don't come up. When we have our events, women don't show up as many as we would like them to. Call is also a new thing in Kenya and activism on call is also a new thing. So we are trying and not just at the grassroots level. We formed uh, a decolonized, uh, and we are also a member of decolonized international, uh, that pushes our agenda and our voice at the national and international level, so that our voice doesn't just get buried here at the local level. Uh, as well, we formed a uh, women movement, that is women working against fossil fuels, uh, right here at the grassroots level to try and encourage uh, women and female activism and participation in the cause, in the campaign. Uh, also now, I'll just sum up by saying, during this coronavirus pandemic, it's an eye-opening time for everyone. While the humans are locked up in homes, uh, the environment gets a time to breathe. That's really scary, really. Why does it have to be like that? Why does it have to be us humans who are destructive? Why can't we just live in harmony with our environment, with our mother earth, uh, and benefit from it and give to it and protect it just like it gives to us. It gives to us life. It gives to us nutrition. Why can't we do the same? So that is an eye opening and should be for the entire world to start focusing on healthier uh, and more healthier greener energy than just you know focusing on destruction like we we humans have been uh, branded to be famous of so the organization during this time like any other organization gathered resources to shift their focus uh, to respond to the virus women have been suffering no jobs their small businesses like selling potatoes and this and that uh, they couldn't do that anymore because of the lockdown but operators and their men who are the breadwinners have no jobs the bus operators boat operators because of the lockdown 
lockdown, the curfew affected fishermen because they fish at night and sell their produce during the day. So now we have uh, very serious cases where people don't have food and women came to support to provide relief food. We also didn't forget the young girls who are provided with uh, sanitary towels by the Ministry of Education while in school. Now schools are closed, they are left helpless. We all also took care of them uh, school committee so it can uh, give them to uh, give it uh, the parts to them we also tailored masks we try everything install water tanks we also didn't forget our lovely environment during this time we planted mangroves uh, very i think it was 5000 mangrove seed, seed 10000 mangrove seedlings we've planted them just during this time because we don't have a case of uh, corona right now and we can move freely except of course taking precautions uh, to not spread uh, and you know be safe and staying safe we still manage to plant mangroves because they are heavily distracted right now by the port project that is uh, that is going on i would like to say thank you very much and i hope that i've delivered a message to you guys and we have a current uh, campaign to sign petition so we can influence the investors like china bank to withdraw their investment uh Sian and uh, uh jacinta will help you uh, uh, uh will point you to the right direction thank you very much everybody great. thanks Zainab. um it was great to hear about um the campaign um, and also all the different campaign techniques we're using, all the community organizing and yeah, really inspiring, you know, your recent successes and the continued resistance against the plant, the, the power plant, and also interesting how the company is still has that colonial mind frame of thinking, you know, the land is empty, the land is just there for them to use and extract. So um, yeah, thanks for sharing that. And um, we'll just move on to, we are a little bit over time, um, but people have posted some great questions. So if people want to stay with us for a little bit longer, we'll just ask some of those questions now. Um, so I think the first question is, was more specifically directed at uh, Lolita. Um, so this was a question around how um, spiritual expression is really foundational for indigenous resistance movement um, and and although there's a we can critique say Christianity for its role in colonial expansion and um, do you see a way that the global north feminist movements can follow the lead of indigenous birth defenders to make a space for spirituality without co-opting indigenous practices Ok, um, voy a pasar directamente a la pregunta. Um, la primera pregunta es para Lolita. Entonces, um, pues parece que uh, la expresión espiritual es muy importante para la resistencia de los pueblos indígenas. Um, pero usted cree que um, los movimientos feministas del, de nuestros lugares del norte global puede um, seguir el camino o seguir el ejemplo de los um, defensoras indígenas con hacer un espacio en sus movimientos para la espiritualidad sin por supuesto apropiarse de los, las prácticas espirituales indígenas. Bueno, yo creo que vale la pena como la, que se planteen otros modelos de vida. Yo creo que lo que estamos viviendo y lo que han vivido compañeras que han sido torturadas y asesinadas no puede quedar como en el olvido. Si estamos pasando lo que estamos pasando, nosotras vamos a resistir. Es muy duro, pero lo vamos a hacer con mucho amor. Pero no se vale que solo los pueblos originarios y solo las mujeres y solo los movimientos feministas de había ya le estemos dando el paso y estemos dando ese desafío. Necesitamos que los pueblos, los otros movimientos feministas también se replanteen otro modelo de vida. Y ese otro modelo de vida implica también el vínculo con la madre tierra, el vínculo con las ancestras, el compromiso también de lo que Europa tiene la responsabilidad por lo que pasa con nuestras vidas en Aviala. 
entonces la espiritualidad no es tan separada, o sea, no queremos espiritualidades individualistas, espiritualidades que solo vean el ego, el yo, y, no, y solo vean su ombligo y solo vean sus narices, sino que si estamos pasando esa tortura, yo tengo que pasar permanentemente terapia, o sea, tengo que estar en terapia permanente por todos los traumas que viví. Entonces, que valga la pena lo que estamos sufriendo las feministas y las defensoras territoriales. Pero va a valer la pena si los mundos se unen. Va a valer la pena si otros pueblos también defienden la naturaleza. Porque no puede ser solo sobre nuestras espaldas. Va a valer la pena cuando se unan con, con mi pueblo también para sacar las 97 licencias forestales que están ahí todavía. Yo voy a resistir, pero necesitamos que también las ustedes luchen contra las empresas transnacionales en Europa. Eso necesitamos, más acciones concretas en su territorio. Y también re, eh, como reconstituyan sus, la espiritualidad con sus ancestras. Tal vez no copiar la espiritualidad maya, pero reconstituir el vínculo con la luna, con sus ancestras, con las cosmovisiones propias. No se dejen vencer por el neoliberalismo. Eso les pedimos, pero de corazón. Eso llora sangre. It's, it's very true that what we need right now is different ways of living, different models to follow. And um, we can't forget the women who have been lost along the way. Um, and we must remember them always. Um, we have to question, it can't be just all depending and all resting on our backs, the struggle, um, indigenous women and on, on the backs of in, and indigenous communities in general. Other feminisms, European feminists have to play their part and question the dominant model of economic extraction um, and look for other models, other forms of being in the world that don't rely uh, um, on, the, on the oppression of indigenous peoples or women of color. Um, these models should be linked to our, our rebuild our connection with Mother Earth. Um, and a spirituality that's of our own making, that's not about um, individualism, that's not about our egos, but that's um, connected to our own ancestors, our connection with our, the earth that surrounds us, our, our history, um, and our proper, our own spirituality that's not just a copy of what, of indigenous people's spirituality, but it also needs to question the ways of life that are the, the model of life um, it, that's dominant in Europe and support the struggles of other communities. For instance, um, myself, I'm in uh, permanent, I need permanent need of therapy for all the trauma that I have lived through as a result of the persecution against me. Um, and we need other women to step up and support us. And for instance, there are 97 licenses for logging still um, uh, operating on our lands in Quiche. Um, and we need more concrete actions to support us in these struggles and to oppose this um, model, uh, economic model. Um. I'll just ask um, two more questions, two more questions, and that can be for both panelists. And then I think we'll we'll wrap it up because we're quite over time. Um, so the next one is around the importance of community organizing. Um, and yeah, and the question is well to talk more about how you organize yourselves. I think people did talk. The panelists did talk about that a little bit. Um, are there particular challenges to creating these networks of support and resistance? And what might be the things that make them work well? That's the first question. Um, and then there's another question here, um, just around um, the what sustains you to continue um, the struggle, um, given you know all the challenges that you've talked about. What what sustains you in your in your work and your activity? 
los desafíos que hemos pasado en la organización comunitaria es que hay mucha represión y mi militarización, o sea, las compañeras que están allá en los territorios no pueden, eh, o sea, yo puedo hablar así con tanta fuerza porque estoy fuera, pero allá se quedaron compañeras que, que no pueden denunciar, que están siendo violadas sexualmente, que las silencian. Entonces, el, el silencio es, es, eh, está institucionalizado porque el pro opresor está muy cerca. Los militares están muy, muy cerca. Entonces, las compañeras tienen que seguir en la clandestinidad para denunciar. El 97% de los casos de feminicidio están impunes. O sea, está la impunidad muy presente. Eso es otro desafío. O sea, la justicia no, 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 no tenemos como el derecho de justicia porque nos miran de ciudadanas de otro rango. Eh, también la, el, la cuestión económica. A veces no tienen ni para llamar, no tienen ni para movilizarse. No hay como estos eh, bufetes populares que nos puedan apoyar. Pero otro desafío también es la salud. Ahora lo estamos viendo con el COVID-19, la salud. O sea, está afectando todos los traumas y todas las cuestiones de estrés postraumático, las depresiones que se viven, eh, la hambruna y toda la, la salud es, es, es emergente. Por eso yo agradezco lo de que este webinar eh, sacó como esa expresión de la campaña para el CPK. Eh, entonces, la justicia... Eh, la, la, el, el alimento, la comunicación y que nos da fuerza. O sea, eh, vivimos todo eso, pero sanamos juntas. Yo, eh, por ejemplo, hay terapias colectivas. La, eh, lo que yo explicaba, por ejemplo, yo estoy en, en permanente terapia. Hay diálogo de saberes. Eso de diálogo de saberes es que no lo pasamos solas, nos acuerpamos. Y eh, estar en red. Estar en red es otra fuerza que nos da otros movimientos feministas, conocer otras luchas en otros lados. Eso nos inspira también. Y saber que eh, la, la inspiración de las ancestras que nos han dicho que algún día esas empresas transnacionales de muerte se van a ir de nuestros territorios. Entonces es una gran ilusión también saber que muy en, en, en el fondo la lucha va a tener éxito, por decir. Entonces, nos inspira mucho eso. Que al final vamos a lograr tan solo vivir vinculadas a la madre tierra. Gracias y disculpen que me, me emocione un poco. Um. So, uh, the repression in the territory is a... Uh, uh extremely brave there's a military presence almost always and um, our colleagues can't speak out and um, i can speak here because i'm i'm outside guatemala but the women who are still in guatemala live close to their oppressors um all the time our region is completely militarized um, the most women have to just remain silent And in terms of sexual violence, there is a 97% rate of impunity for crimes of sexual violence. Um, we don't have any kind of justice. We're considered second-class citizens. Um, we're, uh, <laughs> we Sometimes uh, women don't have even enough money to, to make a phone call or to um, take tra public transport. And in terms of uh, this current situation of the COVID-19, what we're seeing is that the health is really being affected and it's bringing up a lot of trauma and uh, post-traumatic stress disorder um, is being reactivated. Um, but for that reason, I'm really grateful for the campaign um, that was launched during the webinar to support the white flag movement. And, um, that we can at least bring like much needed food to the communities and what gives us strength um well one of as i mentioned i'm in th therapy almost permanently so our we have collective healing processes um collective therapy we're in constant communication and dialogue sharing knowledges sharing experiences with each other 
Um, we're in networks or, and getting to know other women's struggles and other community resistances is also really important. Um, our connection with our ancestors who, who have told us that these, these um, transnational companies are not going to be here forever. At some point, they're going to leave our territories. And we know, so that gives us the strength to know that we're actually going to win this fight. And I'd just like to say um, thank you for having me here. And um, I got a bit emotional because these are very difficult um, ish, uh, things to talk about. And thank you. Thank you so much, Lolita, for sharing um, so much this evening. And um, we'll just go over to Zainab, just since she can answer those um, those questions just around community organizing and also around what sustains you in your, in your work. And I think you were going to share a document that Save Lamu um, has worked on. I saw one of the questions uh, asking me about whether we've done any research apart from the environmental impact assessment. And yes, we have uh, the, uh, the organization plus all uh, consulted all the community members, especially the indigenous, like the uh, Sani, the Awiru, uh, the um, the Bajun people and uh, we found and the farmers fishermen composed of farmers fishermen all over all types hunter hunter gatherers and every kind of uh, 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 um, thing that was relevant to us and we came up with a biocultural protocol and inside it we have a means to push the agenda to be included in development projects and to have our voices uh, heard and to uh, and um, we ways we can organize the community to come up together and concerns and uh, feedback from farmers and uh, uh, and uh, the fishermen and all our resources it contains community mapping and community visioning so I think uh, if you take a look at that I tried to share it I don't know if I was successful <laughs> it was really um, uh, I haven't tried sharing anything before via Zoom, so it was really interesting to try and learn that. I don't know if it, uh, Jacinta will tell me if it's not shared, I can share via email or WhatsApp and she can share it with you guys. Yeah, so we'll be, um, we'll be, Any other follow we'll be sending a follow-up email um, so we can, if you, if you email that to us, or we can, send, we can share a link as well to that. Because um, I think that would be, there's been people, you know, joining from all over the world this evening and people wanted to learn just from, um, from your campaign. So I think that would be great. We can also add that. Um, so. Yes, also we tried to, we, sorry, sorry, Jacinta, I, I forgot one thing. We, we we had uh, with Joseph during our case uh, at the trying to uh, push for the agenda of fishermen and to have them to be compensated for the loss that they incurred to their loss of jobs, reduction in supply of fish. Uh, he offered his services free of charge because he was very um, he was very concerned uh, about uh, the fishermen and the ports coming in without any consultation. So we had people like that from the goodness of their hearts and in kind contributed their research uh, skills and their uh, knowledge and background to try and uh, give us money much uh, evidence or a strong backbone of support for our cases, both for the port and for the coal plant. That's great. Thanks, Aina. And I think, yeah, you've built um, the power of networks and connecting with, with others who are doing the same thing and sharing skills and that power of kind of how the community has organized. And so, yeah, I think we're at nine o'clock now. So. Um, I think maybe we will wrap up, but thanks everyone um, for joining us this evening. And yeah, thanks so much to Lolita and Zainab um, for a really fantastic um, presentation. Thank you. Um, and I think there's, yeah, there's tangible ways to show solidarity. Um, so we will, and we'll share more information and more background. You know, there's been 
interested in asking more information about the companies and things like that. So we can share a lot of that information um, and ways to kind of connect with these campaigns and the work of um, Lolita and Zainab. So we can share that all in the email um, afterwards. So, um, yeah, so thanks everyone for joining and um, yeah, enjoy, enjoy the rest of your evening. And uh, I don't know if Sian, if you want to say anything. I will, yeah. And just to let you all know, everybody can see us right now. I just changed it to gallery view so we can all say goodbye. Um, so thank you so Bye. much to everybody who participated. Thanks for your participation in the chat and especially thanks to Zainab and Aura for their contributions. And I know it implies work and emotional labor as well. And I just want to acknowledge that. So, muchísimas gracias por su participación y se agradece muchísimo el trabajo y el trabajo emocional también que implica participar y se agradece de corazón. Okay, bye everybody. Bye, thank you very much. Chao, everyone. adiós. Bye bye. Friends and thank you. Thank you.